Since I was working full-time at Discovery Institute when Jonathan Wells was writing Icons of Evolution, I actually had the chance to read it in its early forms and going through various permutations. And what's interesting about the book is that, you know, I, I was someone working at the Center for Science and Culture at Discovery Institute, and yet, frankly, there were a lot of things about Neo-Darwinism that I not only didn't know, but uh, that, that I assumed uh, Darwinism had going for it. For instance, you know, I knew about Heckel's embryos. Uh, we had been talking about that for years. But I myself, when I give lectures on, on Darwinism, it would give the finch beaks and the peppered moths as solid textbook examples of evolution in action, at least in neo-Darwinian form. And so I frankly was shocked to discover that even the intuitively obvious examples of Darwinism in nature themselves seem to have problems. So the peppered moth, I mean, it seems intuitively obvious you've got these two different uh, types of moths, you've got changing environmental conditions, it makes sense that you'd get a variation, and we seem to ha have both observed it and to have an, an explanation for it. Well, it turns out that, first of all, we knew there, it wasn't like there were random genetic mutations involved. We already had the populations in place, and so almost as an a priori truth, you could guess that if there were selective advantage to the dark moths, they're going to they're predominate. Uh, but as we looked at the details more carefully, and as Wells discusses in Icons, even the sort of simplest argument that the moths rest on tree trunks, that uh, it had something to do with industrial melanism, all these things, turns out fall apart on closer inspection. I would never have guessed uh, that the case for Darwinism was frankly as weak as it is. And then with the finch beaks, which again all of us usually learn by our sophomore year in high school, yeah, it makes perfect sense if you've got beak, your thickness of your beak in your finch gives you a survival advantage, then you know, your type are going to tend to predominate. But as you look at the longitudinal studies of the finch beaks, first of all, there's the only reason to even call them different species in most cases because they happen to be on different islands. Uh, but secondly, whatever kind of evolution is going on there is cyclical. It doesn't go in any particular direction. And so when environmental conditions change, they tend to revert back to a previous type. Well, that's interesting, and it's of almost no relevance to the overall debate between Darwinism and design. But even in these really simple, uncontroversial textbook cases of Darwinism, what Icons taught me and a lot of people is that even in those cases, it, it uh, does us all well to look at the details more carefully. Icons of Evolution has been uh, sort of a silent killer, if you will. Um, probably no textbook author would be willing to admit that Jonathan Wells' Icons of Evolution actually affected their editorial policy. Uh, but what we can see has happened in the intervening decade or so is that textbooks have gotten more careful. They've either removed Heckel's embryos altogether or they've replaced them with slightly more reputable uh, photographs, even if they still happen to be attached to Heckel's interpretation. Um, in some cases, new examples of natural selection have been added to textbooks. So it's quite clear that if it hadn't been for icons of evolution, there's no doubt in my mind we'd still be seeing Heckel's embryos in their original forms in the textbooks, as we saw uh, as, you know, as late as 2000 when the book came out. So there's no doubt in my mind that icons has had an effect on, on the textbook presentation of Darwinian evolution, even if it often doesn't get the credit it deserves. Nevertheless, I think the rhetorical power of these icons suggests that whenever textbook authors can use them, they will, even if they have to uh, hedge the language or use weasel words in order not to make the obvious mistakes that Jonathan Wells pointed out. I don't know of anything in Icons of Evolution that we would look back at and say it's obsolete. If anything, it might only be obsolete once some of these icons simply disappear. It's certainly possible, for instance, that Heckel's embryos will cease to be an icon of evolution and it will, you know, it will go down in history like the Piltdown Man, something people learned in previous generations. When the book was written, they were the sort of 10 textbook examples that most of us learned in biology class. In fact, they were the sort of 10 things that most people thought they knew about evolution. Unfortunately, what, what I think we can expect to see if Icons of Evolution detected a pattern in the rhetorical strategy for Darwinism is that even when those isolated icons disappear, they'll be replaced by other ones. And so when they're replaced by other ones, whether they be junk DNA or uh, you know, um, antibiotic resistance in bacteria or whatever, um, there's a sort of empirical case to be made by the law of induction that we ought to look at these examples as well and suspect whether these might not be icons 10, 11, 12, and 13.